We're really excited to have author Julian Guthrie, who uh, wrote this terrific book, How to Make a Spaceship, A Band of Renegades, An Epic Race, and the Birth of Private Spacecraft. It's all about Burt Rattan's Spaceship One. Following her, we have Dan Cray, who was a structural engineer on Spaceship One uh, at Burt Rattan's uh, Scale Composites. So at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Julian Guthrie. Throughout history, some of the greatest achievements, whether in technology, whether in the railroads, come from the biggest risks. This young man has returned. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Wow, oh, he would not believe to be a totally macro. It's a story of inspiration. It's a story of the fact that you can do anything if your heart and your soul truly desires. Peter Diamandis is the main character. The X Prize, a $10 million contest. He's kind of like this conductor of this great orchestra, and there are all these other players. Bert Rutan and Paul Allen, Mike Melville, set me on an epic journey, a journey that would have me raise a $10 million cash prize and challenge the world to build private spaceships, take me and my friends up into space. This is, in a way, a band of misfits, people who wouldn't follow instructions, fueled by their own passion, and they went ahead and they, they changed history. Passion and purpose is far more important than any equation, far more important than money. The best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. This story hope is an inspiration to keep taking big risks, whatever you're doing, whatever your spaceship is, so to speak, and at the end of it, that you feel like you can put down this book and you can go out and do something impossible in your own life. That's what I hope people get out of it. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, and I'm so happy I get to share this story, How to Make a Spaceship, which is truly a story of, yes, you start out as a kid by making really amazing things, or just things that you love. Um, this book came out about a year ago in the paperback a few months ago. We have a deal in the works for a TV series, so you may see it uh, uh, as, a, as an ongoing TV series, I hope soon, on Fox. So I've kind of broken the book down into, I think there are five main themes I want to share with you today. And a lot of great pictures. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly because we want to get to Dan Craig, who is, has an amazing story to share. And then we're going to take uh, questions as well. And you can ask about how the spaceship was made or how this, the blimp that you saw, how that flies, anything like that. Or ask me how I got into this story. So the first theme of the book is follow your passion. And there is something very specific about making it yours. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me, said Batman. And this is going to have a lot of meaning, a lot of resonance as we go forward in this story. This family here, this little boy in the, um, in the bow tie is named Peter Diamandis. And he's the son of Greek immigrants and his father became a doctor in the U.S. It was expected that young Peter would follow in his father's path and become the next Dr. Diamandis. He was given the medical kit. That was just what was expected of him. And he, though, had this love of science from a very early age, as early as some of these kids who are here today. And it was something he was never going to let go of. He um, started out making Estes rockets, and the rockets got bigger and bigger, and he started out by making, uh, he continued making motors of his own design, and he and his buddy, this was way before the internet, would order things out of the back of magazines, um, all sorts of chemicals that they could turn into um, basically explosives for their rocket motors, and he and his friend would divide up their stash so put one stash in one's closet and then the other in his buddy's in case the parents discovered 
one stash, they still would have half of it to go. So here he is, um, actually on Long Island, making this Mongo rocket, which was pretty awesome. So that was the first theme. The next one is take big chances. And when you're making, you know, modeling, aviation, rocketry, obviously there, there's a lot of trial and error there. Uh, take big chances. If you can dream it, you can do it, said Walt Disney. And this story is very much about that. No matter how big your dreams are, uh, no matter how crazy they may seem, they are attainable. And here is a young boy who I know most of you know who he is as an adult. Uh, I'm going to show you another picture to give you a clue. Uh, a guy who, just like Peter Diamandis, was obsessed with building rockets and getting to space. He watched Apollo 11 land on the moon in July 1969. Bert Rattan was obsessed with making uh, model planes. Um, any kind, any size, anywhere. His brother, I love this detail, his brother Dick Rattan, who became a very famous pilot, um, would buy these little kits and he would make them following the directions and he would build them and fly them and crash them. And younger brother Bert would pick up these balsa wood pieces and build something entirely of his own design. Bert Rattan never wanted to build something uh, that had already been built, which is really key to what he goes on to do in his life. And a great message, um, going back to follow your passion. Here he is in, uh, uh, in a kit built Veravigan, which is a crazy, improbable looking flying machine. And he is the pilot and looking very much like Elvis in this picture. Amazing guy. And here is, of course, the Voyager, the first plane to fly non-stop, non-refueled around the world, built by this small team in the Mojave Desert, the Rattan Aircraft Factory. Again, people said it could not be done. The military, the US military, had been able to fly half that far, and that was it, with a number of different planes. So Bert didn't believe that, uh, that this quest was impossible. Next theme, which really speaks to the slide we just saw with, uh, with Bert and with the Voyager, an amazing, you know, when, when the Voyager landed in, at Edwards Air Force Base in 1986, it was on the cover of every magazine, it made global headlines, um, and it was a small team doing something really monumental. And I love this quote, where we're going, we don't need roads, follow your own path is one of the key messages of this story that I am so proud that I got to write and that I get to share. Um, this is so true. Remember that boy who was building rockets? Uh, well now, to really appease his parents, to, uh, but to also learn as much as he could about aerospace, he goes to MIT, he goes to Harvard, he gets his medical degree without ever having any intention of practicing medicine. He thinks that maybe it will help him somehow learn the secret sauce to live long enough so he can one day get to space. I mean, so imagine, you've got to have it really bad. You've got to have that space bug really bad if you're going to you know, go to Harvard Medical School and do that just to maybe incrementally advance your chances. So he gets out of college with a six pack of degrees and he's realizing that at this time the space shuttle was flying but it was really over budget and under delivering and it was not uh, doing what many space enthusiasts had hoped it would do which would open access to space. He starts to think about how could I get to space if I can't go there through NASA which was really the only channel. I love on this whiteboard. So he gathers this group of people just like you, of, you know, of rocket scientists, of makers, of big thinkers, and they're coming up with ideas for um, how to possibly get to space, again, without the government's help. And he writes on the whiteboard, small teams can do big things. Um, so this, of course, is a part of the book which is so key, a part of the story. Peter Diamandis is at home, December 1993. He's reading the story because he's, he's about to get his pilot's license as well. And so he's reading Charles Lindbergh's story, The Spirit of St. Louis, which is an amazing book. 
and he has his aha moment. He realizes that Lindbergh flew in 1927 not as a stunt, but to win a prize, a $25,000 prize offered by a hotelier named Raymond Orteg. And Peter is like, oh my god, and he scribbles in the margin and he's highlighting and he's like, when Lindbergh lands in Paris, he arguably becomes the most famous man on earth, but more importantly to Peter, he really galvanizes, jumpstarts a non-existent industry, the commercial airline industry. It was existent, but it was, it just, it showed people that this was possible, his landing in Paris. And Peter thought, what if I could do the same thing for space that Lindbergh did for commercial airline travel? So in May 1996, he goes to St. Louis, which is where Charles Lindbergh famously found his backers, and he announces, he has astronauts on stage with him, he has Burt Rattan on stage with him, he has the head of um, NASA who's there, he has Buzz Aldrin, um, and he announces, this is a great part of the story, this $10 million prize for the first team that can build and fly a manned rocket to the start of space twice within two weeks to prove some form of reusability, the holy grail of space travel. And he announces this prize, and there's a funny detail about it, which I'll get to. So after this, okay, you're crowdsourcing, basically crowdsourcing before this term really existed, your problem. So how are you going to solve a problem without um, kind of the experts help. So experts are clueless at times. Uh, success is being able to move from one failure to the next with enthusiasm. And there was a lot of failure along the way. But when you're crowdsourcing a problem, who are you gonna get? You're gonna get the maverick, kind of off the grid, think different types. You're gonna get a guy who maybe lives in a bermed, octagonal shaped house in the Mojave Desert you're going to get a guy who has the tail section of an airplane as his mailbox. Um, you're going to get different thinkers. You're going to get Burt Rattan. And he started, he, he heard about the XPRIZE. He was on stage that day. He thought, what if I could take everything I've learned about building airplanes and just extend it and get to, get to the start of space? Again, this was like the front door of space. This was 100 kilometers, 62 miles, the Von Karman line, it's called. So you're also gonna get this whole cast of great characters from across the globe. You're gonna get this guy who's in England and he's working in a Colgate toothpaste factory, but he's always dreamed of rockets and of getting to space. He was one of these space geeks, just like Peter. He drops out, he leaves, um, his secure job, he maxes out his credit cards, his wife nearly divorces him, uh, but he ends up building in this quest to win the XPRIZE. He doesn't win the XPRIZE, but he builds what is the largest rocket ever flown from the UK mainland. Nobody said it could be done. You get a guy named Dimitru Popescu, a young uh, graduate student in Romania who drops out of school, much to his parents' uh, chagrin, and starts building rockets in his father-in-law's backyard in the outskirts of uh, Bucharest and risks his, risks his life, um, has this scrappy team uh, subsist on basically nothing, just in this same shared passion, um, obsession, to try to do what others said was impossible. And Dimitri, by the way, uh, ends up flying uh, the largest private rocket ever flown from, uh, from Romania. And the Romanian space officials were not happy uh, because it was what they should have been doing. You get, oh sorry, that was, uh, de, uh, you get Pablo de Leon who's in Argentina and he, uh, he's, he designed spacesuits for NASA. But when he decided to go after this on his own, his colleagues said, basically, it's never going to work. You're going to make a fool of yourself. Don't do it. He did it anyway and really got very, very far along in the process. This guy here, um, he is today the CTO of Oculus Rift. He designed uh, video games, very famous uh, video game programmer named John Carmack. And he designed Quake and Doom. 
um, he thought, what if I could take what I know about programming video games and apply it to rockets? Let's see how this goes. So he founded a team called Armadillo Aerospace in Texas and did some pretty impressive things. Uh, Elon Musk calls him the smartest engineer he knows. So here is the, Dan Craig is going to talk about Spaceship One more in detail, but here is the, um, the cockpit of this rocket that is being built in secrecy in the Mojave Desert, um, a very famous benefactor who tried to keep his name out of it for quite a while, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. Uh, is involved in this, in backing it. This is something that was, if Peter had an aha moment in the crowdsourcing through Lindbergh, this is Bert Rattan's aha moment. And Dan is gonna talk more about this. It's called the Feather. And it was this ingenious mechanism, again, that everyone told Bert, many aerodynamicists told Bert was never going to work, uh, that it was going to, in fact, result in a fatal tailspin, or a fatal spin that would kill his pilots. Uh, Dan will talk more about the mechanisms of that, how it worked, and actually show something off. So this, I think, is maybe the most important um, quality of all, and we all need this in life, and that is to persist through hardship, and when other people tell you it can't be done, or when something is just really, really difficult. Einstein said, it's not that I'm smart, I stay with problems longer. I think it's probably both. Um, so. Here you'll see up in the corner in the, um, in the black slacks and the blue shirt, Elon Musk, uh, who I interviewed for the book. And he was inspired by this story of the X Prize. He thought it was going to re-energize people around space travel, something that had been lost really since the Apollo days. And this is a fun story. So remember how I mentioned Peter Diamandis got on stage, 1996, announces a $10 million prize. Well, he announces this $10 million prize, he doesn't have the $10 million. So he goes after that, it's very bold or audacious or something. So he goes and he knocks on doors. He is told no more than 150 times, again and again and again, no, no, no. Everyone wants to know two questions. Why isn't NASA doing this and what if someone dies? So finally, when everybody told him, dude, this isn't going to work, you've got to give up, nobody's going to say yes to this, he didn't have his money. And the meanwhile, as you saw, all these teams are building hardware, and they're racing to this finish line with a prize that didn't yet exist. So Peter finally, he reads in like Forbes magazine, you know, the, the 40 most successful women in tech, Anusha Ansari, a woman engineer from Tehran who was living in America, had sold her first company, in that article, she said she dreamed of flying on a suborbital flight, which is exactly what this was all about. And he's like, oh my god, I found my woman, my benefactor, that is. And he meets with her, and she gets it right away. She gets it. She's an entrepreneur. She's used to taking risks. She's a quintessential space geek, just like Peter. She told me a funny story when she was growing up in Tehran. This is a true story. She would sleep out on her grandmother's terrace, and she would pray every night. This is how badly she wanted to get to space. She would pray to the aliens, please, please, take me away. She just dreamed of this. So she gets it. She funds a part of the X Prize. There's another cr whole crazy story about um, using an insurance policy to pay off the rest, which is in the book. Okay, so you build it, if you build it, they will come. I think that's the saying. So now, moving ahead in the story, and for the sake of time, um, this is the Mojave Desert. And normally the Mojave Desert is filled with windmills, not with cars. And you had tens of thousands of people coming into the Mojave to see these first attempts by scaled composites, by Burt Rattan, by this amazing, team uh, at scale, these brave, uh, talented pilots, so scrappy, um, so talented. So they, they arrive, and is this going to happen or not? And the whole world is watching at this point, and they don't know what's going to happen. So here you have this view. I love this picture. So scaled had to make not just the rocket, but the mothership. 
So you had, uh, which was the carrier plane, to carry the rocket to around 50,000 feet and then drop launch the rocket. And they also built a large part of the, um, the motor. So this was the morning uh, of one of the XPRIZE flights. Remember, they have to fly twice. And it's a beautiful image, but will it work? Every single flight had anomalies to it. Every single flight was perilous. And Mike Melville, who is one of my favorite people, he was a commercial pilot. He had worked for uh, Burt Rattan for a few decades, several decades. And he was 64 years old when he is first attempting to fly, to white knuckle it, really, to the start of space, to go through the transonics, to get to those precious few minutes of uh, microgravity. And here you see Richard Branson, who's the founder of the Virgin Group, um, who is there watching Buzz Aldrin is right behind him. There's Buzz Aldrin. And behind Buzz Aldrin is Mike Melville's wife, Sally. Uh, who's a pilot herself and uh, lived with a husband who always flew experimental aircraft. And she said she got her wrinkles uh, as, as his wife. She earned them. So here we have, remember that boy who was about these kids' age when he started out? Here he is in the Mojave Desert with his father, Dr. Diamandis, who I think finally gets it. His son isn't going to be a doctor. And is it going to work or not? Everything is on the line. You know, it could be, you don't know how this day is going to end. You see the rocket drop launch shooting straight up. It has to reach that uh, invisible line to qualify. And there was so much drama and so much peril and so many close encounters in terms of uh, the problems that arose during these flights. Uh, but the pilot kept flying. Here you have Peter, the space geek, Bert, uh, the aviation legend, and it comes together on these amazing days in the Mojave. So message, dream big, change the world. And this is one of Bert's favorite sayings, which I love, which is so true. The day before something is a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. So applaud the crazy ideas, embrace those crazy ideas. Um, small team in the Mojave Desert did what others said was impossible. And it's really the backstory to commercial space today. This woman, Anusha Ansari, the little girl who wanted the aliens to take her away, she found another path. She ends up becoming the first female private um, space explorer. She spent 10 days at the International Space Station. Pretty awesome. Here's this boy who uh, just wanted to make cool stuff because it was something he loved. And this dream of his, this passion that he never gave up on, uh, Spaceship One today hangs in the Milestones of Flight Gallery in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And it is right next to the Spirit of St. Louis. So pretty amazing story. And thank you all very much for your time. Uh, I invite Dan Craig, wonderful, who is a structural engineer on Spaceship One. Thank you, Julian, for the introduction. It's an, always an honor to sit, share the stage with you, and it's an honor to be here at the AMA show. So, Spaceship One. Last time Spaceship One flew was 14 years ago, but the story is timeless. Two, five, two, five, seven. Ready? Three, two, one. Landerly. One away. That feels good. On switch is coming. Let me fly in space. Let me fly in space. Let me see that black sky. Good, all set. Copy that. Planning switch coming. Mark. On June 21st, 2004, Ten seconds. a privately made rocket plane launched into history. Left level, left level. Its mission? Whoa, 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 whoa. To become the world's first commercial manned space vehicle. This is not good. If successful, Very rough ride initially. the flight of Spaceship One will open a new era of space exploration. Wow, he would not believe the view. Moving forward to see that black sky. This was a, uh, this was a documentary done on, on uh, Spaceship One some time ago. Has anybody seen the documentary? Or, yeah, it was, it, was uh, it, it appears fairly 
over dramatized, but it was that dramatic. It was a it was a crazy program. And during our spaceship ship, uh, flight tests in Mojave, it, it, it tripled the size of the town. You know, hotel rooms are normally like 40 bucks a night or like 120 or 200 bucks. You couldn't get a room. I had like 20 people, you know, living in my house for that, for those few days. But, so, Spaceship One, first non-government manned spaceship to make two suborbital flights to space within two weeks. Going on to win the $10 million Ansari X Prize that Julian just uh, talked about. Built and flown in less than three years by just a few dozen people. So how is a program like that possible, especially like nowadays with the committees and big companies? And <clears throat> I spent the last 14 years wondering about, you know, how, how is that program possible? <laughs> and the simple answer is just the amazing leadership of, of Bert Rutan. <clears throat> That's what I think best summarizes what made that program successful. So up to that point, I've been with the company for maybe 13 years and Bert had developed over 40 different types of, of uh, aircraft and, you know, uh, had developed and flown over 40 different types. So this is a graph of altitude versus airspeed. So that's the kind of, kind of performance we were used to. <clears throat> the upper right airplane there I kind of uh, highlighted, highlighted because it's still being flown today by Scale Composites, about 4,000 hours on it. It was uh, debuted back at Oshkosh this last summer. Pretty striking airplane. <clears throat> So Bert comes to us and then says, we're going to build a spaceship. And, you know, it's like, what makes him think that we have the capability of building a spaceship? This is the same graph of altitude versus airspeed, or Mach number, that you saw on the previous page, but that cluster of points is what you just saw. And what, we're, what, what Bert was proposing that we do is way out of what we were, way out of our comfort zone. <laughs> so so we, we were pretty sure, you know, us, we pretty much sure Bert had just lost it at that point. He's like, like, what is he thinking? You know? <laughs> but Bert confidently laid out ideas and the details that he thought would lead to success. So here we go. <clears throat> so how do you build a spaceship? You would think it would be an inherently complex. It's a spaceship has to go to space, right? Well, he, he, he tried to keep it as simple as possible in, in, in every turn of the corner. You know? <clears throat> the first thing, no cabin heat or cooling for the pilot. And that sounds ridiculous. You know, I even, you know, when I put that up there, I, I, earlier I emailed Bert and Mike Melville and Matt Simons, the head engineer, is that really true? Is there really no cabin heater cooling for the pilot? And they said, well, yeah, it's, it, it's only goes, the time it drops from the mothership, goes up to space, comes back down, it's only five and a half minutes. It's not, it's not very long at all. And the, the pilots are sealed in a her hermetically, you know, sealed capsule, basically. It's, it's insulated, it's double paned windows. So, I mean, I guess they wear lots of clothes and socks and I don't know, but, but uh, there's no active cooling or heating. Small round windows <laughs> to minimize at least structural stress and weight, maybe not pilot stress because the pilot has to peer out of these little windows. <clears throat> no pressure reg regulator for the uh, reaction control thrusters. Those are little thrusters that when he's in space, it's used to reorient the spacecraft. Basically, it's just a big scuba bottle a 6,000 psi scuba bottle that blows down. That's, that's pretty simple. No active stability augmentation. It's all uh, hand flown. There's no computer. <coughs> There's no throttle. It's either you got on or off. <laughs> no front wheel. You're only landing, you're not taking off. So you, once you drop to the mothership, you, know, you don't need the front wheel, you just land on the, on the skid. There's no propellant pumps because the one of the propellants is nitrous oxide that's self-pressurized, about 700 PSI. There's no real thermal protection. They, they, they say that they had thermal protection, but no, it's, it's really Bondo. <laughs> Not really colored Bondo. So, uh, uh, no separate pressure in tank. Sometimes rocket motors use a separate pressure in tank. It's, just, it's all self-pressurized. There's only one rocket motor control valve. To keep things really simple, it's just one valve. Valve opens up and spills the nitrous oxide through the, through the rubber fuel. There's no in-flight gear retraction method. It's only a one-way gear like the space shuttle. It comes down, it, you don't have to retract it. It only goes one way. It's all spring-loaded. <coughs> and the rocket motor assembly is glued to, to the fuselage with silicone. This, this next picture kind of shows that. that it's the, um, the big ball there you see is the nitrous tank that's, that's glued with silicone to the sides of the fuselage, the walls. 
the fuel part of the rocket motors, the, the cantilevered rock, the tube off the back is lined with rubber. So the rubber is the fuel, nitrous oxide is the oxidizer. There's a valve in between the two. And once the uh, valve opens up, it starts spilling the nitrous through the, uh, the tube in the back. And there's little firework sparkler things that get everything really hot and get the whole combustion process working. So it's, it's a really simple system. You, you can't, it's, you know, it's virtually uh, foolproof. One other cool thing about this picture, though, is you know, it's a spaceship, a, a winged spaceship. So it has to fly subsonically, supersonically, and in space. So it needs three different kind of control, control systems. So subsonically, those are all the push rods you see going to the control stick in the front. It's just like, um, you know, like a Cessna at the local airport. It's not, there's nothing you know, magical about it. <clears throat> but once you go supersonically, those don't work. So the outboard stabilizers in the bottom part of the rudder are electric, electrically actuated you know, for supersonic uh, you know, uh, travel in space. But once you're in space, those don't work. So then there's little reaction control thrusters in the wingtips and the nose that, that uh, it just uh, blows out pressurized air from the, the scuba bottles I mentioned earlier. So that's, that's how, um, in space, how they reorient the, um, the spaceship. But it's, it's kind of, it's a very interesting design. So we still weren't convinced that we could do this. <clears throat> so, but, but Bert methodically laid out each step that would re be required to be what he thought would be successful. And the first step, we, we got to build the, the mothership. We got to build our own, like B-52, the drops the XF-15, we got to build our own, you know, the carrier aircraft. So it was no coincidence that the nose of the, uh, the mothership looks just like the spaceship because it's made from the same molds, same materials, same windows, uh, same systems. So it's a way of, of exploring and exercising everything that's, that's, that's going to go on the spaceship first in the mothership. It was absolutely genius. The, uh, we'll talk about the feather later, but the, the pneumatics that raise the, and lower the feather are the same pneumatics that, that raise and lower the landing gear on the, on the mothership. So he's, he's, he's duplicating as many systems and structure as possible. And, and the pilots, they can you know, fly the mothership as much as they want. They can simulate the same approach. They can get really comfortable with the environment before they have to fly the actual spaceship. So it's absolute, absolute genius on Bert's part to, to build, build it this way. Next uh, step, of course, build the spaceship. <laughs> so, so uh, <clears throat> and then after this, it was pretty much, um, you know, it's kind of a common you know, sense kind of approach. You, you carry the spaceship on the mothership, see how they, the, the two uh, handle together, and then, uh, the, the, of course, drop test the spaceship one as, as a lightweight glider without any propellant see how that handles and then, uh, then you drop test and exercise the feather we'll talk about the feather but it basically it folds the spaceship one in half for uh, re-entry and fill the nitrous and and, and uh, shoot the nitrous out the back to exercise the whole rocket motor system uh, eventually fire the rocket motor for a short dura duration burn and then fire the, the rocket motor high enough to actually uh, exercise the, the feather where we'll talk about it where it folds in half for a a supersonic reentry, first full rocket motor to uh, flight to space, and then we're ready to go after the X, uh, and sorry, X Prize. So just two more flights to win the prize, and we're done. You would think you know, it'd be like uh, that simple, but it almost was. So, oh, this is a kind of interesting pictorial. We put this on the side of the um, the mothership that uh, records each one of the, the test flights. So flights one and two up there. Those are the uh, captive carry flights. And it, where it circles down, you can see where we dropped it. And, and, and uh, one, I want to point out, like, like a flight 11. That was the very first time that one of our pilots had to hit the, the fire rocket button. You know, and that took a, a huge amount of bravery. <laughs> that was Brian Binney, who was the first guy to step up and hit the, hit the fire, you know, fire rocket motor. And he was, he'll forever be my hero. <laughs> and to watch, we were out there watching it and, and, and see that the little speck up there suddenly just almost accelerate out of your, your visual frame. It's like amazing. It's like, there's a human in there. It was like, wow. Yeah. Oh, and this scale tries to be kind of clever with the end numbers. So the 328 kilo Foxtrot, anybody know what that might stand for? You know. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, it's what defines space, 328,000 feet. Is, 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 it's an easy way for me to remember now because the end number, but that's, that's what the edge of space is defined as, or 100 miles or 62 kilometers. But. 
Oh, and one, another story real quick. The altitudes of the, of the higher flights are above the, uh, the spaceships. So the third of the last flight is 328K, or 328,000 feet. So the third of the last flight barely, barely made space. It was just like, like 328,000 feet, 400 feet. Just barely made it. <laughs> and we're like, we're sweating on that one. Like, we're we gonna make it? <laughs> and so there's a matrix where every pound that you can save on the spaceship, you go 129 feet higher. So we were very weight critical. Like we're, we're trying to take everything out of the spaceship to make it as light as possible. So because we we're just over 400 feet over the uh, defined definition of space, after Mike Melville landed on that flight, Bert walks up to him and says, well, good thing you didn't have a really heavy breakfast this morning because I think we had, had too much weight. Don't think you would have made space. So that, that, that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. So uh, this is where uh, Bert was, was most concerned about reentry. Because he, when he was working at Ed, Edwards Air Force Base, uh, uh, Mike Adams was killed in the X-15, was another winged spacecraft re-entering space, and it, it came in at, at, at the wrong attitude and it broke apart. So, so the way a winged spacecraft enters from space is really critical. You know, the space shuttle has to hit right at the right angle, X-15 the same way. So Bert was very concerned about that. So he came up with what he, what's a, really a breakthrough, where he can fold the airplane in half, and it creates a really stable configuration where it's kind of like a badminton shuttlecock where it just it doesn't matter if you're upside down or sideways, it'll just naturally reorient itself as it, as it descends into the atmosphere. So the, the pilot could be unconscious or could be eating his lunch, as Bert says, it doesn't matter. So it's, it's a, very, a very clever way of uh, making things as safe as possible. So this, this is kind of an overall view of the, of, um, the actual flight uh, profile where you drop from the, from the mothership, the boost is about a minute. <laughs> You're in space for up like three and a half minutes. The uh, coming back in is only uh, about a minute. <clears throat> uh, max over four Gs, the deceleration is like 16 seconds. It's, you know, it's a pretty high G load, but it's not, it's not too bad. And then, you, and then, you're, then, then you de-feather, and then glide back in as a glider. So it's, it's, not, a, it's, not, you know, it's not that hard. Well, it depends. <laughs> depends yeah. It works, yeah. <clears throat> so these were our test pilots. Doug Shane, Mike Millville, Pizza Bold, Brian Binney. You know, these guys are the bravest guys in the world to me. He's like, There's no way I could, I could do what they, they were you know, stepped up to do. But also, nobody ever flown an, an airplane that folds in half like that. So as we're getting closer and closer to, to doing the first feathered flights, I could sense um, a lot of tension. I wouldn't say they were, they were scared, but they were very curious <laughs> about like, what they were about to step into, because nobody had ever done this before. So being a model airplane guy, you know, like you guys, I, mean, I feel like I'm among family, you know, it's, it's like, I'm a model airplane guy. I went home, built the model of Spaceship One, uh, they could do the whole, uh, whole feather. Here's the feather. You see it kind of bobbing in the recovery. Victory roll. This model is made out of carbon rods and ripstop, by the way. Kind of like an uh, old uh, stick of tissue. <laughs> so the, the next day I took the model into, into scale composites. Thank you. <laughs> into scale composites and walked past Bert's office and says, hey Bert, you might want to see this model fly. And Bert said, come back here, let me take a look at that. So he, he wiggled it around and said, it's too flimsy, it's not going to fly. I said, well, it flew okay yesterday. <laughs> so, so we go out on the ramp, he uh, hand launches it for me, go up to the full feather, uh, land, and he got so excited, he runs over, he shakes my hand, I'll never forget that, that's so cool. And then, and then he says, wait right here, I'm going to get all the test pipes lined up so they can watch it fly. So he gets them all lined up, I, I demonstrate it again. And it's like Bert saying, see, I told you it would work. You know? So this is the first um, uh, demonstration of it. Later, he was contacted by a, a uh, university aero professor that um, told Warren Bert that it's going to go into a, a fatal spin. It's not going to work. It's really a bad idea. And Bert just shot back, well, we've already done subscale RC model testing. That, that's all we had. And that was it. <laughs> so, 
But I mean, she had a point about uh, supersonic reentry, but that was we we uh, it was comfortable supersonic reentry with um, CFDs, computational fluid dynamics. So we were, he was pretty confident it was going to be okay. So oh, I threw this in for the model group. I've, I've had since then, since the program, I've had more fun with the, the with the spaceship one concept. What this is, it's a real simple profile spaceship one mothership. The only power is coming from the spaceship. It's it's one of those little um, ducted fans off of like Horizon Hobbies MIG. It's a so it's, a, it's a, so the, the mothership has no power at all. Mason that will be presenting later on today about Strata Launch, he's, he's my pilot for the, um, the mothership. And I'm flying the spaceship. Here's the drop. The drop isn't active, it's just, you just back off on the throttle and it slides off the hooks. It's really fun. You can see the mothership coming in to land. That's Mason. That's in front of the, um, the, the shadow launch hangar, by the way, the world's largest wingspan uh, airplane. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and then I. I threw in this next video. I was trying to make a bigger spaceship one model, but uh, this this one didn't end too well. And you can you have to kind of listen carefully. What well, my kid says at the end of this, my 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 uh, ten year old is filming this. That's Jeremy Robbins I work with. <laughs> Dad? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I don't recall saying that. <laughs> um, a little bit about Bert's management style. <clears throat> he had this way of, of kind of, it wouldn't tell you exactly what to do. It wouldn't really micromanage. But he would create this reality in front of you where you could see, I, I think we can do this. I think it's, it, he had a way of just whipping you up into such a frenzy of excitement that you couldn't wait to start working on whatever it was. But uh, like he didn't micromanage, but he, but he chose those that he trusted uh, to do the work. But he also trust those people he, he chose, he trusted that they would come back to him with concerns and problems. So that was another level of trust. That like, like Bert, I don't know what to do about this, but uh, I need some help, you know, kind of thing. One of, one of them was on, on the Spaceship One structure, you know, I did a lot of composite structure, but here you got this rocket motor, you know, real high energy density in the back that's, that's shaking the whole airframe. I said, Bert, I don't know what that vibration is going to do to the, to the airframe. And, and Bert says, well, you know, it's, it's, it's mounted in silicone. It's going to damp out. Once you're in space, there's no acoustics. I, I think he's making things up, but, but, but at least he, he, he knew my concerns, and that was good enough for me. So we, you know, kept going forward. This is a cool uh, picture. That's Paul Allen sitting next to Bert Rutan. Uh, Mike Melville's on top. This was uh, second, second to last uh, spaceship, spaceship flight. Scale did not make that sign that Mike's holding. It was that somebody in, in the crowd was waving it. So, so then Bert runs out and grabs the sign and gives it to Mike. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I think Julie and I both like the same slide. Uh, spaceship one next to uh, Spirit of St. Louis and next one in the milestones of flight gallery in the uh, Smithsonian. So Spaceship One was 14 years ago, and Bert made a big deal about trying to inspire kids. And back when they were doing the spaceship flights, there was a, a wealthy developer in the area that, that rented a whole bunch of school buses and loaded up the kids uh, to give them the day off at school to come out and watch the historic space flight. And so, so, you know, and that was, you know, the whole idea was to, that inspire the kids of that, of that time. Bert made a big deal about any kids that wanted to come up and touch spaceship, you know, that, they, they, you know they, could, they could come up behind the ropes. And so it was really important to Bert to try to inspire the youth, because they're, they're the future. And I'd like to think those same kids 14 years later are maybe the same, maybe the engineers that are working on what's happening today. And with, with today, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing 
it's an amazing period to be alive. You know, you got Virgin Galactic with Richard Branson, Strata Launch at scale, SpaceX, holy cow, you get a, you know, a Tesla Roadster in, you know, in space. You're like, well, man, Bigelow with his inflatable habitats and Blue Origin. You know, I expect uh, he's working on a lot of things secretly that's about to come out. That'll be, that'll be fun to watch, what Blue Origin is up to. So, uh, if anyone has questions for either of us, who has questions? Come on, Come on. I got lots of questions for him, right? Okay, hold on. Uh, if you use nitrous oxide for the oxidizer, what do you use for the fuel in the composite motor? Uh, just, just rubber. Yeah. Just rubber? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Where, where's the mothership these days? Where, where's the white knight? Yeah. You know Go what uh, Pine Islands Museum. What? Pine Islands Museum. Oh, it is? Oh. Yeah. Uh, since uh, Pine Island yeah. paid for it, it said oh, in, yeah. in his museum up in Seattle. Yeah. So, and he has a replica Spaceship One next to it. Yeah. yeah. And there are a few replicas of Spaceship One. There's one at Google. Mm -hmm. um, there's one at the Museum of Light in Seattle. Um, yeah. And a couple others. Yeah. That are pretty cool to see. Bobby. Yeah, in the lobby at Google. In, in Mojave also? Oh, in Mojave, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. How, how did you manage the creativity and the various ideas that were, diverse ideas that were coming into the project? How did you manage them towards completion of the project? How did you manage With all the ideas that were coming yeah. in, um, how did you kind of winnow it down and come up with a plan? Exactly. You want to answer that or? No, you know better than that. <laughs> you were inside. <laughs> uh, that's kind of a good question. It's, that was mostly Bert. Bert was laying out the, the, the big picture, which way to go. I mean, he, he was, Bert's really good about bringing in, bringing in experts and listening to their opinions and then deciding, you know, what, which way to go. Yeah, he's, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't try to invent everything himself, but, but he, he'll listen carefully. And they had two competing, uh, rocket motor companies and so he likes competition also and so this one did a little better than the other one so he chose uh, the space dev but yeah that's a good question but but as far as the details go he lets the engineers kind of take care of that you know but it, but the, the big picture the general general direction he'll he'll point the he'll point the herd in that direction <laughs> so. but it was very scrappy too i mean uh, there was a lot of just make things up as you go and trial and error and use materials that um, you know, had never been used before in this same way, and so it was very scrappy sort of program, brilliant program, but also just some nutty things. Uh, you know, one thing that I love that's in the book is the thermal protection of Spaceship One is like something you cannot, when I heard about this, when I learned about it, I was like, you cannot make this up, it's so great. So they had tried all sorts of sophisticated um, properties for the thermal protection and they were about to do a, uh, their first supersonic flight and um, Bert said just try to use Bondo and just slather it with you know Bondo the nose cone and the engineer Matt Steinmetz was like what are you kidding me so he tries it does some heat tests on it brings it back to Bert and is like oh my god it worked and Bert's like, what worked? And he said, the Bondo. And they, had, again, tried all these sophisticated things. And Bert said, OK, well, it can't just be Bondo. You have to make it proprietary. So go out, buy some cinnamon, oregano, and mix it in with the Bondo, because they were doing this red, white, and blue theme as well. And uh, so that's exactly what they did. And that's exactly what Spaceship One had when it went to space. And people say if you look closely enough, you can see little flecks of oregano on the side of the real Spaceship One. So there was all sorts of crazy stuff like that. When they barely made it to the start of space on their first flight, Bird had this crazy idea, actually in this case it truly was, um, to strap Sidewinder missiles yeah. onto uh, Spaceship One, yeah. onto the rocket. And at that point, the test pilots were like, no way, we trust you to an extent, but that was like pushing it way beyond. So there was a lot of um, trial and error. Fortunately, they didn't get the Sidewinder missiles. 
I think a lot of that's due to Bert's uh, origin of building model airplanes. Yeah. You know, was the, yeah, it, 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 when you scratch the building, you, you, you got to constantly problem solve and think on your feet and work with your hands. And I think it's from Bert's. Yeah. Uh, but it, Bert also had this joy about him. I don't know if you, you know, where he would go to work and uh, other people would, sh his employees would show up or his partners and. And uh, Bert would be like, come on, everybody, let's go outside. Look at the sky. Have you seen the sky? There are clouds in the Mojave today. Yeah, let's all jump in an airplane and go fly through the clouds and take pictures. So there was the incredible hard work. And then there was the, you know, enjoy the moment and the beauty of where we are. And uh, they would fly off to lunch. And uh, so it was a place where Bert kind of worked around the clock. But... Um, was Mojave, there was a, else. there was yeah, but there was a lot of joy to it to the to discovery. Yeah. Thank, thank you both. Uh, can you hear me okay? Test test. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both for the great presentation. Um, for Julian, just wondering uh, how Peter got entree to sort of the space community um, as a physician, you know, a, a trained physician. And for Dan, just wondering where Scaled Composites is now as far as what, they're, uh, what kind of programs they're doing. So Peter had launched a rocket company. I forgot to mention that while he was um, getting his medical degree at Harvard, he had a rocket company he was running in Houston. And so he was doing, he had launched uh, the International Space University while he was at MIT. He had launched um, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space while at uh, MIT or Harvard. So it was this international, or first it was a national space club and then the International Space University. And then he had the rocket company while he was in medical school as if he didn't have enough to do. And um, then the X Prize, of course, you know, it made history. and. You know, everybody from Jeff Bezos to Elon Musk to Richard Branson to all these folks who I showed you some of their pictures who jumped into the mix to try to, you know, make this happen with him. So it was really his passion that drove him and that gave him the credibility and the hard work. And then he, you know, he, he offered the incentive to make this moment in history happen. Yeah. And the question for Scaled was? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, um, Could you actually, repeat the question? Huh? Could you repeat his question? Yeah, uh, he was asking what's the latest project the scale's working on. Uh, later on today, uh, Mason Hutchison is going to be talking about Shadow Launch, which um, that's, that's actually that's the big, it's the world's largest wingspan airplane. You know, and I, maybe once it flies, it's considered an airplane, I guess. It hasn't, it hasn't flown yet. <laughs> but um, a 380 feet, 385 square foot. Er, uh, foot wingspan, I think. Uh, that's currently the all-consuming project that's scaled. You know, it's, it's a lot of a lot of stress. I think it's been public, publicly announced they're going to try to fly later this year. So it's being funded by Paul, Paul Allen, the same person that did Spaceship One. Uh, there's, there's a lot of smaller programs that scaled, but that's the, the big one right now. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Thank, thank you so much for the presentation, amazing. Uh, I have one question for Julian. Uh, what was the most, if you pick one thing, what was the most impressive thing about this story? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is just the persistence. And I mean, the technology is super cool, the pilots were really brave, but everybody had to persist to make it happen. Um, Peter had to persist and find funding uh, Bert Rattan and his team had to persist through the problems, through the challenges. Um, the pilots had to persist through the flight anomalies. Um, so that was really it. That's what I, so impressed me and that I love. is like the best of the human spirit um, that the story embodies. And this bravery and this persistence and this kind of think different mentality. Uh, but I guess if I had to pick one, it would be perseverance. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. So I, we're gonna Dan and I will be over signing books right after. Uh, if you want to get books.
Everything you heard on the stage and more from these two great speakers is in this book. It's absolutely terrific. So thank, thank you, you, Julian. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.